OTB's The Hurling Pod with James Skell and Paul Murphy. People of Galway, we love you! I don't want to leave the people of Waterford down, you know, because they're my life, you know. People of Waterford are my life, you know, and I, 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 love, I, love, I love my county, you know. We love John it's almost like they're afraid to kind of mm. go and hurl and yeah. just let themselves express themselves. They're, it's like as if they're nearly afraid to make a mistake and sometimes you have to make a mistake and just throw off that bit of nervousness and have a go. Yeah, it's pure constipated hurling. Welcome along to episode 11 of the Hurling Pod. Lots for us to talk about. The banner beaming after Clare make it back-to-back wins in the Munster Hurling Championship, beating the league finalist Cork and leaving them now on the brink of an early championship exit. Dublin sit top of the Leinster Hurling Championship. They've got three wins from three. Donald Burke with 11 points as they saw off a pretty stubborn challenge from Westmead in Mullingar on Sunday, while Wexford hit Leash for six to boost their scoring difference. We'll also be taking a look at probably the most analysed handshake since Keenan McCarthy back in 2001 as Galway edged out Kilkenny with a very late Conor Cooney free in a thriller in Salt Hill. Who better to dig into that game then than former Kilkenny defender Paul Murphy and ex-Galway goalkeeper James Skell. Lads, a very good day to you. How are you doing lads? Hi boys. Where else to start but the handshake itself? We just saw the <laughs> image of it there up on screen. I mean it's been talked about a lot in the last 24 hours or so since the game finished in Salt Hill. James, you were covering the game for off the ball. Tell us about your theory on it, because you were talking to uh, Joe Malloy about it on off the ball pretty much directly after the game. And Joe said we yeah. have to give Murphy a 30 minute grilling on this. But you think maybe there was a little bit of beef between Cody and Shefflin when the handshake was taking place? Yeah, like I, I can only look at, assess like what, what I saw, you know, and people have all their own opinions. And they'll, I said they'd be, they'd be assessing body language and assessing, you know, the context of the game and what happened two minutes prior. But what I saw was Henry going over and he see it in the handshake. And a real awkward exchange, to be honest. You know, it didn't look like he was fluid at all. It didn't look like there was, you know, you'll, you'll often see hand, managers shaking hands. It's a split second. They, they touch hands, they're, they're gone in their opposite directions. But this one, there was kind of an awkward hold for a second or two. And, and as I said, a, a disappointing look. I, I call it a father looking at his son disappointingly, the way Cody looked to Shefflin. And I, I don't know, I, I couldn't, I, I understand Brian could have been very, very, you know, disgruntled about the decision and the way the game finished especially after Kinney kind of I suppose clawed themselves back into it and I, I get that like and that could have been in the back of his mind also which I'm actually I'm sorry it'd be at the forefront of his mind when you consider how soon it was after the after the game um, but still from what I saw it, and even in real time it, I, I said to myself that didn't look good that didn't look good at all you know and then when you see it in the slow-mo and like we often see fouls and, and incidents in slow-mo and they highlight the thing 10 times worse God, it looked it looked terrible. <laughs> it, did, it, did, it looked bad. I have to say, you know, and like I have people tweeting me there and tagging me for the last twenty four hours, caught saying it's utter harsh like what I'm saying that it, it was only just a respectful gesture between two men. I completely disagree. You know, I I had to do something way different from that. I just thought it's like Brian was disappointed in Henry somewhat. That's what, that's what I gathered. You know, that's what I gathered. Now listen to me. I could be so far from the truth, but that's what I gathered in 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 real time, and it was only backed up when I saw the footage from RT. Yeah, look, I'm no body language expert here, Skell, but just as a perfect neutral, I've got no foot in either camp here with Kilkenny and Galway. My thought it was that we can definitely read too much into it. And with the Sunday game last night particularly, it was different to real time, where it was very clearly slowed down. And then the kind of aggressive look that Cody gives across at Shefflin when Shefflin had turned his shoulder to go in the opposite direction. It was like, Cody seemed to be making a beeline. You were there, so you obviously saw it in context uh, mm-hmm. in Salt Hill itself. Where to me it looked like Cody wanted to get across to talk to the officials about the free. Shefflin kind of beckons him over for a handshake. The handshake takes place. And once the handshake is completed, Shefflin's happy enough to walk back over towards the sideline. And he's almost taken aback when he realises that Cody is still staring at him and holding his hand. Is that yeah. a fair analysis of what you saw from that's, the press That's, that's very fair. I, I, from what I saw, I saw Gert, Gert, or Martin Comerford making a beeline for the referee. And I saw Cody heading in his direction also. Um, and then I saw Shefflin kind of going over towards Corey's direction. It looked it looked like he gave him a shout or gave him a kind of a I suppose maybe they caught Island. I don't know, but it looked like that Henry definitely initiated. The handshake took place. Henry turned around and jogged straight back into the dressing room. Off off he was gone, and then Corey Cody kind of looked perplexed a small bit as if he was you know I won't say stunned. That's the wrong word to use, but he just kind of stopped in his tracks for a moment and then he kept going. You know, so I don't know. There was something in his mind. <laughs> Whatever was in his mind. Obviously, the decision was in his mind. The result was in his mind. But it was an awkward exchange for sure, and 
I I will read a bit into it. Uh, you know, I know people will say Don't, you can't read too much into. It. I will. Uh, I just it looked to me like that Cody was. He was nearly. I have to say this now in respect for Manor. He was nearly hurt by what had gone on. You know, in in this. I don't know. Is it, do you go back further? Do you go back to Henry taking over Galway in the first place? Do you go back to Henry not joining Brian's backroom team? Henry not taking over an underage Kilkenny team? I don't know. Do you know what I mean? But it just looked like the Brian was disappointed in Henry and that uh, he should be still in the Kilkenny corner as opposed to Galway. Right, we'll put the grilling on to Paul in a moment. But James, on that point about Shefflin not going in with the team, apparently there were two invites that came from Cody and he turned both down and he's gone his own direction. We were talking about this last week and we were we were kind of half laughing that the handshake or the hug between them was going to end up on the back pages, which is exactly what transpired. Maybe not in the way that we expected it. I kind of wonder how much of it, though, was down to Cody not thinking about that, but thinking about how annoyed he was with the way that the game finished. And the reason I think that that was in his mind, mm. and people have probably seen the picture from three years ago when Leash played against Kilkenny in the round robin, Eddie Brennan, another of his long-serving generals, managing Leash, very friendly handshake and the arm around the back for Eddie. The only other time that I remember Brian Cody been this annoyed when he went over to another manager was used to go way back 10 years ago when Galway got a late free against Kilkenny and there was an aggressive enough meeting of Anthony Cunningham and Brian Cody. Have you ever seen Cody be like this before with another manager, other than that? <sighs> Okay, let's go back to that, that instance you're on about the 10 years mm. ago. That was on the back of a free that, that where David Glynn was fouled and it was a point and we ended up getting a draw. And even the body language and even facial expressions, the exchange between Anthony and Brian was so obvious. It was so obvious that, that what they were, I suppose, arguing over was the decision gone prior. But this one was different. You know, this, this wasn't the obvious decision. It didn't. There's, there's looks and then there's looks. And this kind of look was a bit, I don't know, a bit hairy. And you referenced in uh, Eddie with, with Leash. And like, look, to be honest, right, Kilkenny were going to play in Leash that day. I, I would be 99.9% sure Brian knew Kilkenny were going to get a victory. There was no threat whatsoever. So in, in, in the eyes of, of the overall context of it, he knew Kilkenny were going to get a victory and he'd still be, you know, in, <laughs> he'd still remain in top position. Here, it's different. You know, Kilkenny have played Galway a number of times the last five or six years. It's always been close, always been close. And I don't know, when one of your own, like we're delighted to get him. I am delighted Henry is with us because We've never got an insight to Kilkenny. And let's just be honest, the closest insight I've ever got, got to Kilkenny was probably Jackie Terrell's book. That's the closest. And even that wasn't huge, you know. Um, so for us to get a person of Henry's stature for what he's done in the game, uh, on and off the pitch, like he's dominated the club game and now to come to Galway, like that's that's a great coup for Galway. And I just don't know how that's gone down locally. So I will pass the mic over to Mr. Murphy and yeah. say, tell us, the, tell us the inside secrets there. How are things down there? <laughs> Oh, look, I don't know. Um, to be honest, like there's a hundred opinions about it, and I, I probably sided Will a small bit more. I mean, um, f- from all my time with Henry and, and Brian, I mean, I think Brian has openly said it that Henry was just a model player, obviously enough. But like, you know, Henry and Brian worked well together because both were very driven and both had one goal in mind. And again, during their time as manager and player, they both rubbed off each other really well. I didn't never experienced anything in the time that would. Uh, lead you to believe that there was going to be a handshake like there was yesterday to be honest and again just drawing on my own experience of Brian I, I, I would put it down to um, how the game finished really because I've seen Brian react before really I suppose towards the end of a match when something like that would happen and even to think back to the 2014 um, final against Tipperary and the free against Brian Hogan that again you're looking at it where he ran and he collided with Paddy Maher and it was given for charging now after that, okay, we got away with a draw, but like when there's no time left in the game to vent the feelings you had, I think that's something that Brian was displaying when he shook hands with Henry. Then it was basically a case that he was potentially going to say something to Henry about maybe, um, you know, how Tommy Monaghan was on the ground, or maybe, you know, regardless whether you feel it was a free or not, I'd say Brian would have said to him, like, you know, that's not the way we would have played the game. I'd say it, for me, it was something in that line. I don't think it runs any deeper than that. Like, Will, you're right. I, I've heard myself that Henry was asked in and so on. But again, look, Henry obviously wanted to do his own thing with management and felt that he'd have his own way of doing it and maybe that wouldn't be best suited with Brian. And look, again, lads have to make these calls themselves. You know, you're, if, you, if you want to put your own spin on management and you want to take the big job, you know, you have to stand alone and, and, and make the calls yourself. And that's something Henry wanted to do. So, but I don't think that would sit badly with Brian or Anthony. You know, Brian himself had to do it at some stage in his own career and step out on his own. 
So to be honest, what I think was at the end was just the way the game ended. The fact that Kenny could have got something. Um, the way, was it a free, wasn't it a free? And the fact that they lost the game, final whistle. Brian was obviously quite angered with Colin Lyons, wanted to go over to him. And I think Henry got caught up in that. Like Brian's anger was <laughs> tunneled towards Colin Lyons. Henry called him, went over for a handshake. Brian would find it very hard, I'd say, to change his temperament there and then. Um, and like when you slow it down to however many frames a second that we've seen it in, in every angle at this stage, it looks a hundred times even worse. And that's not me trying to dampen it down, but I, that's all I really think it was. It was a two-second handshake. There was something there. There was a needle there. But I don't think it runs back to deep as five years ago or ten years ago that something would have happened and it was, you know, it was showing up in a handshake there. I really do feel from knowing Brian that it was the end of the game, the way it finished and that kind of ba- bitter taste or that bad taste it would leave that you lost the match in that way. I think that's what we saw in it. Yeah, look, it's never easy either, Paul, when you see one of your, and in Cody's case, a genuinely one of his long-serving generals from on the pitch going off and managing against his own county. He'll understand exactly why he's doing it, but that's just the entire intrigue of all this for those of us looking from the outside and watching this and analysing it and over-analysing it. You basically have arguably the best hurler of all time up against the best GA manager of all time. The game itself was intriguing, had a thrilling finish to it, and then we get this little bit of kind of, you know, needle at the end of it. It feels a little bit tabloidy talking about it as much as people have, mm. but it's incredible intrigue and it sets it up very nicely if we get Kilkenny and Galway in a Leinster final later in the year or if these teams were to meet again. Because I guarantee you every paper preview will have that picture. That video that we saw is going to be used in the video package beforehand. This creates a nice little narrative should Kilkenny and Galway play each other again. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, when, when people were talking about it after the game, um, like I didn't see the handshake straight off and it was only when the people were texting me saying, what did you make of that or whatever? I was kind of saying, geez, that didn't make sense. And it's only afterwards I thought about it and went, maybe it kind of does make sense. Like the reason I would say that, you know, I could guarantee that Galway got a great man in Henry Sheffin is like Henry is driven and he's tunnel vision on the job he's doing and there's no sentiment involved. You know, I'd say maybe the strange feeling, if there was any for Henry yesterday, was seeing him in a wine top or maroon top, whatever you want to call it, managing against Kilkenny. Like that part of it, he grew up fighting for Kilkenny for all his years and now he's playing against him. There might have been a small bit of that, but the reason he such, would be such a great manager is there's no sentiment involved in it. He's out there to get the best out of his players. He was there as a Galway person over the weekend, no doubt about that. He was there and he got the result based on that and you could see it in the team. They were working really, really hard for him. So afterwards, it kind of did make sense. I mean, there was no sentiment between Brian and Henry, and guarantee that. And that's probably what makes the two of them as successful as they were. There were. Lots of times over the years, they had to put sentiment aside, and it came down to winning a match. It came down to doing what was necessary to win. And they're two savage competitors. Were so, they close, Paul, when you were in the same dressing room? Were Shefflin and Cody close? Would they have been pally? Because I mean, we've heard Tommy Wells talk a few times about your know, conversations he would have had with Cody in the off-season or maybe you know early in the year he'd go down to the dressing room and be talking to Cody before games. Were Cody and Shefflin particularly close? Was there What kind of relationship was there? Yeah, like, I, I, I don't know if close the right word. My brain used to manage in a certain way. There was always a bit of distance, but certainly you'd have your, you know, you'd have, you'd talk to Brian and he'd ask you how you're getting on and different things and you might have your conversations. Depending on the train session, you might have a bit of a laugh and a joke or whatever, but like the managers and that, they'd, they'd get ready in a separate dressing room, the selectors and players are doing their own thing, they're getting ready. So there wasn't this kind of, we're all getting tugged out in the same dressing room, we're having a laugh or when we're traveling on the bus, the same thing. You certainly would have seen them over the years. Um, having conversations and having a laugh and a joke whatever they were talking about but it wouldn't been a case again like I said you never got the feeling that Henry was calling over for a cup of tea after training it was never anything like that you know Um, but certainly I mean of course Brian would have looked at Henry as Henry was the epitome of everything Brian was trying to get out of players and what what, what Brian was looking for in players I mean that's an obvious statement but the work rate what he what he demanded out of players around him I mean he he did a lot for Brian with that and Brian needed that in dressing rooms more than Tommy and JJ and Jackie and all these lads Henry was one of those players did they get on I'd say they did to a, to, to a certain degree but again I have to say that there's always a distance between between Brian and, and and a player he just keeps that because that's the way he runs it and it's been very effective but I do remember one thing that I think it was Henry that actually said it or maybe it was Brian that said it a, a few years after Henry left it was just that when Brian was saying in a, in, in, a, in a training session or in a team meeting that, you know, players, he wouldn't name anyone, but he'd say, you know, players aren't working hard enough or certain players think they can walk onto a team. He'd never name names and it wasn't directed. Like, if you were a player sitting in that, you wouldn't think, oh, he was talking about player X, Y, and Z. 
But Henry always said, one of the things Henry said afterwards is, anytime Brian said that, Henry thought Brian was talking about him. And Henry would take that personally. And you'd see a reaction out of Henry. Now, I'm sure you'd see the same with Tommy and, and Jade and so on. But that's the way Henry would have been taken over, that he would never have thought that Brian showed him special treatment or anything like that. It was a case that if we were in a dressing room, even if Henry was after busting himself on the pitch, if Brian said something along the lines of, listen lads, there's some players here and they're not working hard enough and if you think you're going to walk onto this team, the general things managers say, any time Brian would have said that, Henry used to take it that, he's talking about me there, that's personal, he's on me, I'll show him the next day going out. And I think that was only something maybe Brian realised afterwards. You know, you make these general statements to get it out of all players, hopefully. But when your best player is going at it like that, that's the relationship really that I would have seen over the years. And so for that to work, I think there has to be a small bit of a distance and not this real pally, uh, I suppose, relationship, which I didn't overly ever see. That to me sounds like the way the star pupil is often treated by a teacher where you know that you have to keep on pushing them. Because, of, I mean, mm. clearly, in Shefflin's case, ridiculous talent, works ridiculously hard. But Cody would have probably known in the back of his mind as well, Paul, that if he's kind of thrown out these slightly kind of loose claims about the way the player's been playing, he probably knows because of Henry Shefflin's mentality that Shefflin's going to go, right, I'm going to prove him wrong. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, And, and it's one of the big things that, um, one of the strengths that Brian always had and, and still has is Brian doesn't, Brian doesn't care what any player thinks of him. And if 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 Brian says something to a player in a team meeting, and he, he would have said it to me over the years as well, he'd say something and you know might get under your skin and that if it has you walking out in a training session reacting and that's your anger. Sometimes players with anger and that hurl with a bit of anger, you know, they bring savage edge and that's where you get the best out of them. So Brian would never be afraid to say something to a player um, that would get that reaction out of them. And if you walk out of the room, Colin, like in your head, Brian thinks you're walking away going I'll show that bollocks or whatever like this <laughs> happy days because you know that's the reaction he wants on the pitch he wants a fella that's willing to fight that will take offence to someone saying to him that you're not working hard enough that's what Brian wants so definitely yeah I think you're right there that Brian maybe knew what he was at by maybe saying things like that but again very I'd say very rarely he would have had, ever had to refer to Henry in that line because you know Henry demanded the most out of himself any day he went out anyway yeah, before we talk about the game itself, um, it brings her nicely to one of the questions that we got in. And remind me never again to do an Instagram ask a question for the lads on the Sunday of a bank holiday when people are clearly on the beer and the amount of comments <laughs> that we were unable to use that came in overnight were just absolutely incredible. Uh, but some made sense. And Daniel Diskin was one of the ones, uh, James, who was in contact. He said, what would have been going through Henry's head walking up to that handshake? I would imagine what was going through Henry's head when he was walking up with the handshake was not the handshake that he received. I thought he he probably thought, I'm going to walk over, Cody is going to shake my hand, and we're just going to move on. I, notwithstanding okay. the fact that RT had mentioned, I think, uh, after the game, that both managers declined an interview before the game. So read into that what you want. And there were also claims that Cody had arrived not with the Kilkenny team bus, maybe because he didn't want to make the story about him and Shefflin going in. So both were probably very aware that the narrative going in was this Cody versus Shefflin thing as opposed to uh, the teams that were playing. But what would you think was going through Henry's head walking up then? Would it have just been purely, I'm going to go up, get this handshake out of the way, and I just move on? Yeah, I think, I, well, I think absolutely that would have been the case. That like Henry would have just went, geez, yeah, I have to get over here to Brian and shake his hand. And, you know, we've obviously, what's done is done now, shake hands and head off. And that's why I think, we like what James was saying there, that there was an element nearly a surprise as what was after happening there. Because I don't think Henry was expecting that. He was expecting to go up and shake the hands and head off. So... I, I do think that that was kind of the moment where Henry said, yeah, we'll go up here, get the handshake, and people will get their pictures, and that's the little bit of the circus done. But that little extra second that was added on to it, I think maybe just was a little bit confusing for Henry as to he wasn't expecting mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. You reckon the same, scale? I, I do, because like even even throughout the game, and uh, like the first half was, was, you know, it was probably, I'd have to say it was more of a Galway show that they, they, they were kind of well on top. But in the second half, Kikini got a great run there for the first 20 minutes and things got exciting and a bit frantic. So there was no exchanges between Brian and Henry on the sideline. You would expect opposite managers there could be a bit of verbal. It wasn't really like, it was It was very pleasant, you could say, to, to it, to as, as pleasant as, as it could be in a championship game. So I, I would expect that when Henry was going up to to uh, have the handshake, it would be a split second thing, go up in a respectful manner, say probably hard look on the game, turn around and move on. That's exactly what I'd say he expected. And him as a sportsman, like I don't think he's a genuine sportsman, like an, an honest an honest fella, I don't think he would have thought anything other than to say hard look on the game and then move on. So I think there's uh, probably been enough spoken about now. And you're right, I think the narrative was 
kind of, as I'd say, altered by the media to, to make it a bit of a Cody by Sheffield. Because it, it's a huge story. It's a massive story, right? And it, it did, I won't say overshadow the game, but it definitely, it definitely was the primary reason why there was so much media presence there yesterday was to see, you know, as, as we said before, the master versus the student, you know, 11 All-Stars versus 11 Ireland. And the two of the guys soldiered together for the vast majority of their own careers. Like, so it's a huge story, but I, I think both now are, are probably, let's say, glad it's done. You know, it's over. They're both for, next game. Next game. That's the way I think both those people are. And I guarantee you, all the players in each dressing room, same thing. They, they wouldn't have thought twice about the, the Sheffield and Cody situation. I guarantee no Kenny player thought about it. You know, and, and definitely no goal player thought about it. So they're just thinking about the next game coming up. Um, so the book, and that is closed for now. Yeah, over for at least a month until it gets now. reignited yeah. potentially if they meet again. Well, let's not overshadow the game then. Let's talk about that decision because... This is divided opinion. Uh, Derek McGrath was saying in the Sunday game last night he felt it was an unfair call against Kilkenny. That in many ways in you know days gone by, the argument would have been man and ball both got cleared in the one. Do you think it was a free, James? Uh, look, I, I saw it in real time. So when I spoke yesterday to Joe, to Joe Malay um, on off the ball, I, I didn't have, I suppose, the, the benefit of a... Of a, of a TV replay. A replay, have a replay. So I just saw it live. And when I saw it live, it looked like there was kind of contact with the head. But I said to myself, Paddy got the ball. Like he looked like he got the ball. It looked like Tom didn't get initiate the first contact. So, so Paddy didn't go through him. You know, and I, I have to be honest, it's it's one of those calls whereby if I was on the receiving end of it in terms of being the aggressor, I'd be very disappointed. I would have been, yeah. And like there's people in Galway that would say to me, What are you talking about? Like that was it was an obvious free. Yeah, but you have to look at it from objectively. And it Paddy went balls for the Balls out for the ball. He went straight up, eyes on it the whole time, and he got it. Like he got the ball. It's unfortunate the contact happened with, with Tom the way it did, and I think for, from a, from a decision perspective, I think Colin got that one wrong. Yeah, um, Paul. From the other angle of that would be, it's impossible to win the ball in that case without making contact with the head and without coming through the player, just because of the relative positions that are there. For you, is it a free? No, again, I, I would obviously say it's not, but I'd agree with James by saying that you would take it. Any team would take that free, and it's one of those ones, like if we're still here talking about it, it's a tough one to call. Um, it goes back to the argument of if there's an element of doubt. Like it was two players competing for a ball. I think if Joe Malloy said, look, you want to see a game ref the same in the first minute as the last minute, as the 30th minute, 100%, and I'd absolutely agree in it. But, you know, if, if, if that call happened... 20 minutes into the game and there's no free like we forget it happens it, it wasn't so obvious um, Paddy Deegan did get the ball in, but he did collide so there, uh, for me like I think there has to be an element of so many times and we saw the tackling was ferocious over the weekend it was brilliant it was brilliant by both sides and different like Kilkenny probably started the brighter in terms of tackling but then Galway really dominated um, and those kind of hits you know not deliberate hits on the heads but I suppose indirectly lads were colliding with each other fighting for balls and it, they just, I suppose, they just come into the match in a different way. Like, I mean, that was a very obvious one. Two players going up very cleanly. If there were one or two more players around it, it might have shaded the fact that Paddy Deegan had come running from, dis from distance in to actually get the ball. But I just think at that stage in the match, Tommy Monaghan was static. He was going up. It looked maybe a little bit worse than it was. Did Paddy Deegan connect with him? He did. But I think it's a very hard, I think it's a very hard free, or a very harsh free. Um, like, it's a physical sport we have. We obviously have to have, you know, restrictions in it that protect players and so on, but there was no bit of malice there from Paddy Deegan to injure him. Um, still, though, look, I suppose I have to give Colin Ryan's credit. It, it's a tough call. It is a very tough call in the heat of battle, goal after going in. Another, I suppose another element for her to say was, you know, did he blow the whistle to blow it out if I really want to dissect it? But I don't think he can even be that hard on him. You know, he was letting the game flow to a fair extent. But, um, look, we, I suppose we'd argue in Kilkenny it wasn't a free flip it around and and if we were offered that we of course you'd take it to win the match but it's it was definitely a, a sore way to lose it after Kenny just about there was a crack left in the door we got in got a draw and again at the end of the day when we see how the table is balanced if you really want to step back from it, the table is really finely balanced at the moment and we saw how Galway were limited a good few years ago we've nearly mentioned it every week on the score difference very fine margins will tip this in terms of who comes one two and particularly three and it's looking like it's going to come right down to the crunch so there's potential that we look back on these decisions and I think if there's any air of doubt and if, 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 if it's leaning towards doubt, don't give it, you know, just let it, let it play on or even, I think time is up at that stage even, you know, blow it up. But uh, look, I, I don't think it's the last we'll refer back to it because I think this table is going to be really finely balanced at the end. Um, but 
to sum up, I don't think it was a free no, but again, that's probably my bias shining through. Mm, if teams end up on level points at the end of this, it's going to be one of those pivotal moments in the entire championship to decide who would have you know, potentially taken the points away from Salt Hill on the day. Galway get a couple of points on the board, James, which is the key thing coming out of the game mm-hmm. for them. And I think crucially, after what happened, and we talked about frees that were given and frees being overturned against Wexford and thrown away the lead they had that day. Again, I thought Galway looked comfortable enough coming down the stretch and then Kilkenny get a goal that's a little bit fortunate with the way it found its way into the net. Mm-hmm. Galway still has to dig it out to get the win. And like in fairness to Conor Cooney, he had to hold his nerve, pop over that point at the end to get Galway. What feels like a crucial win now. That's a huge win because you're not, now you're undefeated against two of the big four. Or two of the big three, should I say. Uh, and you're going into a game against... Uh, against Leash in the coming weeks which you're going, you're going to expect two points there may be an opportunity to probably fluctuate with the squad a small bit just to change up a few things give maybe give the likes of Cahill a, a bit of a break or Joseph Cooney a bit of a break and then get get into the last round against Dublin um, all the while they've got a huge battle against Kilkenny that, that, that's a monster game now when you consider as Paul said the context of the overall groupings I have the table here in front of me and Dublin on top at six so I'm expecting Galway to go to seven and then Kilkenny in Dublin like I do expect Kilkenny to beat Dublin in Dublin so that puts them at six, Dublin at six, Galway at seven, and Wexford being five. It's going on to the last day. Mm. So like Dublin, Dublin could potentially come to Pier Stadium, and if the, if they turn over like Galway, they'll 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 go to eight. You know, um, Galway could be in a bit of a pickle, let's say, with her to get to the Leinster final. So I'm hoping now with with what Galway have done in the last two weeks that they win out and get straight through to the Leinster final. Because Lord knows you don't want any other any other games in the meantime. So. It's a it's a great it's a good group like it's exciting and um, for me it's much more exciting than the Munster Championship you know, when you consider what what we're getting and look at I know the the entertainment value mightn't be as vast as you watch to see in Munster or, or or the or the quality of game mightn't be as good but certainly for what we're getting in terms of um, down even intensity in every game it's 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 great um, like the game itself like we like there was twenty two scores instead of yesterday in twenty two minutes it was a flyer like the pace of it was brilliant and I I tweeted yesterday like old style hurling. Like I'm not saying going back to the 70s or 80s where there was pulling and swinging, but it was there was there was a good mix of long ball, 50-50 contests, man to man, good hard hitting. Like you know, the possession game was there for elements of it, but not as not not, not what you see in in other games. I say, and um, it was a real kind of sort of 15 on 15 go at it game. So it was exciting. It was a great game, I thought. And um, yeah. like I was kind of concerned. I was like, it took us 20 minutes to score for play in the second half, and I was thinking like, and Killy were. They were just chipping away the whole time, chipping away, and Owen Cody was looking ever so dangerous. Like he was excellent until Park Manning probably took up the mantle for the last few minutes. And then I just thought Galway then kind of stopped the rot, grounded out a bit, and then they got three ahead, and it felt like they were going to see it out. And lo and behold, I've been on about it for the last couple of weeks. Up they come, then the lads, <laughs> and they strike a goal. Like, <laughs> oh, I cursed more in the press box than I saw. But <laughs> would like, you know, credit them. Like, I, I have to say, it, it was a mix of. Um, of great play from Owen Cody to get the ball first of all in a rook when there was hurdles and bodies flying it and then to have the wherewithal to do a top hand pass which was great skill super skill to John Donnelly and John had no other option but just to go for it um, so I think Aina a bit disappointed with the way the goal went in but then he showed great great uh, awareness I should say of the situation to get the ball out of Tom Monaghan and we've we've just covered that instance so look good game overall two teams went at it and um, as a goal I'm delighted to get two points yeah, Paul, that's one of the real plus points for Kilkenny coming out of his own Cody's performance. I'm sure we'll talk about TJ Reid being substituted at halftime in a moment, but his own goal, wonderful piece of skill, does incredibly well for the second goal. And like he was Kilkenny's leading forward in the sense of the way he showed for the ball throughout the game as well. We know about his incredible talent, but uh, a brilliant performance from him yesterday. Yeah, great performance from him. And I think it was just the manner that he went about it. You know, there was no settling into the match with own Cody. Um, even the balls he was winning, you know you'd be getting onto your forwards to win them but you nearly expect more of them not to be won than what Owen Cody was winning over the weekend he was winning consistently these 60-40 balls I'd say like a ball that maybe a defender might get a flick into Owen Cody was just getting the hand down and as soon as he got it into the hand he was just taking on the defender and he's a big man you know it's not a case that he's one of the smaller players electric speed and this is what he does he's a big man he'll push out the way and he'll run at goal and then just I suppose the creativity of him for the goal that he went through, he didn't look for a free, you know, he was getting tackled going through, ran into a bit of a cul-de-sac, turned around and one-handed, slapped it to the goal and then ran in and hit his shoulder then on Tain inside the goal, you know, as in he was playing with this fire, he even got a free down in, in the first half, um, he was running down the left wing, he got fouled, he got up and he kind of just let the Galway lad know he was there and again went back about his business, again it was, I think it was fairly pivotal, the Park Mannion got on top of him for the last 
And when I say get on top, you know, it was a 50-50 battle, but he won, I think, three or four balls at the end, which were important for Galway. When you see how it finished, it was really important that we won because they were, they were having a lot of problems in trying to nail him down. But even still at that, Owen Cody was still in the match. He was still winning balls. He was still causing problems. He was still breaking up play as well. But, you know, for a player who's come off winning Young Player of the Year twice, he seems to be just even building. You know, this isn't going to his head. He's building, he's building. And he just has a great aggression about him. And as a Kilkenny supporter, it's just brilliant to see that there's a fellow up there who, regardless what type of ball you give him, he'll work with it. And even wherever he is on the pitch, he'll get it. He takes on his man. Like there's nearly very little coaching needed with this fella because he's doing all the basic things so well. But it's brilliant for Kilkenny Sporter that we have someone up there that you can pretty much rely on in the heat of battle. At big matches, he'll turn up and he'll fight for you and he'll do his level best to get a good few scores, which he's getting at the moment. There was a bit of a surprise when TJ Reid came off because there was no indication that he was injured. I don't think he is at the moment. It's not a day where it really happened for him, Paul. No, didn't work out for TJ. I think he might have maybe one or two possessions from play in the first half. Um, missed missed the first free as well, which, look, it, it'll happen as well. Nearly commentators cursed Tony Kelly did a similar enough thing down in, in, in Turles as well. So, look, those things can happen. But again, look, I think it's just something... We go back to talking about Brian. Look, Brian requires a certain, uh, I suppose, performance for players that you're getting on the ball at least. And look, it just didn't work out for TJ. It happens... I suppose when you're TJ or you're Joe Canning or you're Patrick Horgan, it's maybe highlighted a bit more or you're Tony Kelly because there's a certain level expected from you. But you saw a few decisions, like one of the big decisions that I thought reflected what Brian was thinking was Alan Murphy when he was brought on, I think, after about 30 minutes for James Marr. Like Alan Murphy obviously took over freeze then once once TJ went off. But Alan Murphy brings a savage work rate to that middle part. You know, he really gets into the dirty ball and he wins it. And it's getting that primary possession when the ball breaks down, which Kilkenny were struggling against Galway with in that, I suppose, that, that second quarter, if you want to call it. Kilkenny were struggling there. So introduced Alan Murphy. And I think going forward, we're starting to see a small bit more of a shape onto this team that that, that Brian is moulding here. And I think we'll see Alan Murphy starting um, the next match in Dublin because, again... One thing Brian will want is, regardless what you do, and he wants lads getting points and getting scores and different things, everybody's job is to win that primary ball, get into the rooks, fight, hook, block. When we saw Alan Murphy coming on, he was chasing down the sideline. And we're going back to talk about TJ being taken off. Look, the ball just didn't break for TJ. He didn't get on a few balls. He was well marshaled as well. In fairness, got way back. I think Dahi Burke was on him at one stage. Um, there was lads had him had him nailed down. Um, so he didn't have a good day at the office. Yeah, TJ will know that himself, but... Again, look, I'm sure TJ will be de- determined to bounce back. And I've heard a lot of commentary around it again, I suppose, talking about TJ's age and different things. Look, Brian wouldn't be playing him and TJ wouldn't be playing if they didn't think that he was fit enough and he was good enough to still be doing what he's doing. Um, so look, at again, TJ's coming back from an injury. There's lots of things there to for, for TJ to get back to the, the pitch of his game. But look, I've no doubt TJ will go back working on what he needs to work on and, and no doubt he'll be on the team sheet the next day. But maybe there'll be one or two other switches, I think. And like I said, Alan Murphy might be another one that we'll see actually starting the next day. Just from, I'd say, what Brian took away from the work rate and the fighting for the ball that we saw against Galway. Mm. James, notwithstanding, Di Burke had an excellent game, I thought, mm-hmm. overall. And you were saying last week he was going to be crucial if Galway were going to do well this year. You need him to be at his absolute best at number three to kind of mind the house. And you look at the spine that Galway team, there's great strength there. And some of your strong players did brilliantly to overturn the ball. But when it comes to TJ, you said in the radio uh, yesterday afternoon that, look, TJ Reid is not the TJ of old when we're assessing him right now. But were you surprised that he got the curly finger at halftime from the Kilkenny management, considering TJ is still that type of guy who can give you a moment of magic and you might want him out on the pitch to see if he can feel his way into the game in the second half? Yeah, I... I, I think everyone in, in kind of in the in the media circle press area was all collectively surprised that he was he was coming off because it looked like at half time that I suppose the attitude was that go you have to put in a great half there were six points the difference and you know if you continue going to claw back they need TJ Reid on the pitch you know regardless of his performance the first half the ball look it didn't bounce from like but like he was there was probably five jewels where, where the ball came down overhead between himself um, and at different stages Dahi Darren Morrison Gareth McInerney and they were all broken in front so he didn't he didn't you know get the primary position like we're, we're used to seeing him doing and um, there was a couple of balls where he got into his hand you expect him to take it on now take it on like he like he would go for goal and went over the bear and it, he just didn't look as sharp like and then when you when you think back like he's played obviously the club final with Bally Hale then there was a break for the man like let him get married let him have his time off his honeymoon so he's he's not up to probably the full pitch of where other lads are off are, are at so like he but he's not he's not probably 
he doesn't have the foundation of training or, or matches that the rest of the forwards have had because he's obviously had a prolonged break to do other things outside of his life which are which are necessary so i think for him to come off yesterday it was i i i, I do side to paul in the way what he said about um the game kind of dictated that you bring on more workhorses if that makes so like what well, the way it was it was all doggy dog a lot of ball on the ground a lot of 50 50 challenges you know an awful lot of of uh, of kind of the opposite of the possession game it was it was kind of win your own ball and that kind of wasn't really bouncing for tg yesterday and look respect to the man i i, I will stand by it like he's not the tg read of all. that's just like he he can't be like how can you still be you know going up in the years and expect him to produce what he produced when he's 25 it's just not it's just not going to happen you know so like he probably has to do what Joe did and tailor the game a small bit, maybe tailor his position. I don't know, do you know? But none better to figure that out than, than the lads down there. But um, yeah, it was like I, I was surprised he was taken off. Um, like, will he start the next day? Absolutely. I can't see how he wouldn't start like a man of his importance. You know, considering what he what he what he's capable of producing. And um, let's see, take from there. On the point of Joe Canning, because it's a really interesting article from at the weekend in the Irish Times, intrigued to what you think about this, James. He was talking about um, how he got motivated in many ways, how he dealt with criticism. And he pointed out that he still got a picture on his phone now of a headline from a match report from a league game that Galway played against Wexford in 2017. He said the headline was Fitzgerald charges lay down marker as Galway flops blow six point lead. And this, of course, fit in brilliantly when he was looking back at the game from two weeks ago when Galway surrendered a lead too. He said that that stayed there and it was something that Michal Donoghue had brought up that was, we're not going to mess up in another game. And of course, he went on to have a fantastic year in 2017. And also pointed out that I think it was start of that year yeah he says he he opened up the 42.ie when someone had sent him a link it was an article that Jackie Cahill had written about nine players who've got big points to prove in the upcoming National Hurling League he says he was shocked that Patrick Horgan had been mentioned in any way because of Horgan's abilities and then he said the biggest shock that he had was that his own name was there when he was coming back from a career-threatening knee injury says he was shocked that he'd been out for seven months and he was a player who had to had something to prove when he came back but basically used both of them as motivation I'm guessing for you, who hurled along with uh, Joe Canning for so long, you're probably not surprised that Joe Canning used every bit of criticism against him as a way to motivate himself. No, I, I would be one bit surprised. And I, I think pe- players in, in every sport who are probably at the top of the sport are just a bit, maybe a bit different. You know, and they, they probably use different elements of motivation to uh, to kind of get them to a next level because, you know, I suppose players of. <laughs> Would you say standard ability mightn't get the the media attention that would be focused on the main players and like i remember seeing you know that article that was written in the 42 and it was just pure click shit. like you're talking about players generation players who are the best of their time and the, the stuff to prove no they don't you know but he's the type of person in fairness that he would use that as absolute fuel so i wasn't surprised to read that quote whatsoever because it's he he'd, he'd look at the paper and he'd nearly see you'd see him shut the paper fast you know do you know what I mean and you'd say oh God, that's bottled that's bottled now for future and again go back to context like we had come off um, our Ireland final defeat in 15 against Kilkenny uh, then we came off a, a crazy semi-final against Tipperary in 16 so we were kind of one of the top you could say three or four teams in Ireland at the time and that defeat that we suffered at the hands of Wexford in the league was seriously frowned upon by the Galway public because they were perceived to be 8, 9, 10th in the rankings at that time so it looked like at the time that we uh we were going nowhere, to be honest. Um, so everybody was on was on the team's back and on the management's back. So I think collectively there there was a, I suppose a shut up shop if you if you like, you know that. Forget about the outside noise. Bottle this inside here and let's just show everyone. And like I said, yourself then went on a run and we remained undefeated for the rest of the year and uh, the best year in Galway's history. Mm. It just reminds me as well, James. We talked about this thing before on the first podcast. It belies this idea that players don't pay any attention to what's actually written about them. Because yeah. you can't but see it. Like, but I mean, certain players, see, this is the thing you see, I, players do pay attention, but then you've got some players who are just a complete enigma. So the likes of Dahi Burke is just different. Like he wouldn't care if the media showed up to his house and started giving out about him. He's just that kind of person, you know, because out over his head, he doesn't give a shit. You know, other players then, let's say, would read it and might need some support to get around it. Mm-hmm. And you've got other players like Joe who wouldn't need any support and just bottle it and say, I'm going to show them. You know, and I, I would probably put I'd, I would assume Henry's in the same bracket. I'd assume Patrick Corgan's in the bracket. I'd assume the Roy Keane, the Katie Taylors, all these people are in that bracket whereby they just look at that and go, I'll show them, you know, whereas other players are the complete opposite. I laugh at, I laugh when I think of Dahi because it's just that type of person. And you have loads of them probably in, in, in teams that just don't give a shit about what anyone says about them. They just want to go and play the game. So everybody's different. But like that, the big players probably take it a bit, uh, a bit more to heart when they're being 
some, some, sometimes personally it's actually some, mm. sometimes being questioned for, for the way they're, they're operating on and off the pitch even though they're trying to do their best so I'd say as well look it's probably different for Canning and this is why it's interesting now that he's writing these articles in the Irish Times because we get a bit of an insight into you know how he was thinking about the way that he was perceived like I think back about Joe when he was a teenager and I remember when Portumna were going well and he was coming in and everyone knew that he was just remarkable talent and he was up in front of the media I remember we went, we did an All-Ireland final preview night in the dressing rooms in Portumna and you got Joe who I think was 16 at the time was sitting in front of about 20 hacks who had um, their recorders ready to talk to him and straight away he's been talked about about you know fulfilling his potential when he goes to Crow Park and all this kind of stuff he had to deal with that all throughout his career he was then you know the prodigy minor with Galway and then everyone expected when he went to the senior team that he was going to be the guy that would lead Galway to an All-Ireland he had to wait probably a little bit later in his career than he would have expected but he went on and fulfilled everything became hurler of the year won an All-Ireland championship and was key to you guys winning that All-Ireland yeah. in 2017 but to have to listen to all that noise like I would say Joe Canning was probably talked about more than any hurler because his career overlapped with the social media age like DJ Carey only had to deal with the newspapers it was only really towards the end of Henry's career that there was as much online as there is now basically Joe Canning lived in the spotlight for all of his inter-county senior career yeah but you know the parts that I, I found it very difficult to understand like so so if you're a professional sportsman so if Ronaldo right is getting talked about left right and centre He's getting paid to do exactly what he's doing on the pitch, you know. So he has no real, he doesn't have to forge a personal life or a professional life outside of the sport. Where I was, I would look at Joe and say, the man still has to do, if you go back to the minor days, he has to go through his leaving search, he has to go into college and he has to get through his, his degree, develop a business, etc. And everyone associates him with the game. So they, they never, I, I would always have thought at the time that no one would ever look at him as a, Having, having a marketing degree or start being an entrepreneur starting up a business you know they'd always associate with hurling first so it might it would have been extremely difficult for him to carve out that path you know so kudos to him for what he's done you know on and off the pitch and he dealt with it very well like very very well it never seeped into our dressing room for that way yeah it never spilled over whereby he was annoyed or over anxious about people talking about him in any, any manner like he was he held himself to a very very high standard like when i hear paul talking about henry there's striking similarities in the way they would have operated you know very driven people very tunnel vision and um, wanted success all the time and i would have said publicly we probably didn't offer him the most support on the pitch you could say to get him more i, guess I won't say get him but to get more victories for everyone um and and like he's uh he's he was a remarkable player and and like it, it takes it takes a different type of person to be able to, I suppose, take in all the noise but also block it out all the time. Like he was always very and I guarantee you that media night that G did will he was always very forthcoming, like he'd be very seasoned in the way he talks to people. You know, he I, I'd say he probably had to turn down an awful lot more requests for interviews and for appearances than than, than one would like because I'd say he was inundated with stuff throughout his career. So he had a lot more to contend with than, than the normal five eighths of a player. Yeah, and look, he always still gave me one of the most entertaining moments of all time when he went on OTBM last year and said, oh, no, lads, I, I'm, I don't know about retirement. No, God, I have to <laughs> think about this. And I've had a few niggly injuries, but sure, yeah, yeah. no decisions <laughs> as yet. And the next thing he went to a press call, I think about 25 minutes later and went, yeah, lads, this is the moment I have to admit. I'm finished. I'm gone. Yeah, FD, <laughs> FD, I'm out of here. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, my, sorry, my o, sorry, Owen Sheehan for telling you lies about 20 minutes beforehand. <laughs> but um, that was incredibly, incredibly entertaining. But I'm enjoying reading him at the moment. Paul, with the rest of the games in the Leinster Championship then, I was uh, working on the radio yesterday, so we were broadcasting Leash against Wexford and Westmead against Dublin. And um, Westmead gave Dublin a proper good rattle. It was 12 points to 11 at halftime in Mullingar. They were to bring on uh, Kieran Doyle for the second half alongside his brother Killian, who was leading the scoring for Westmead again. And even as the game went into the melting pot, Niall O'Brien puts in a goal for Westmead and gets the score back to 22 points to one goal in 16. So three-point differential after the ball's gone the net. You're wondering if in the last six, seven minutes of normal time there's going to be a grandstand finish. But to Dublin's credit, and as James already mentioned, they sit top of the table with three wins from three. Dublin showed a little bit about them in the closing stages again, like they did in Wexford. Scored five points in a row to come out 27 to one sixteen winners. This Dublin team are just kind of motoring along nicely ahead of what will, argue, will of course be the two hardest tests that they've got coming up now with Kilkenny and Galway. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And again, look, we saw Kilkenny um, in their first match going to Westmead or, you know, once once they got up there, I mean, it, it didn't pan out necessarily the way we thought it was going to pan out straight away, right? They put a bit of distance between them in the end. But Westmead gave them a serious game and I've played up there and, you know, especially when you play up in Westmead, it, it's a tough place to go because... 
they, they do have this thing and they do hit you hard and they do let you know it's a home match and it can be quite tight up there as well we've talked about the size of pitches and all this but it is a tough place to go and that's not being patronised Anthony it is but we saw again look they, they put up a serious challenge to Dublin Dublin again to their credit um, created that space towards the end because it could have been cagey once it got back to three points coming down the home straight it can get cagey and we've all been in those matches where you know, the nerves start to seep in. You start maybe making decisions you wouldn't normally make if there was a little bit more distance between you. But, you know, fair play to Dublin, yeah. Look, they got the five points. They, they got the bit of distance and came out with the victory. And, look, it is important. Again, we, we've talked about it quite a bit. We look across at Wexford and, you know, they gave out a, a fairly big beating to Leash. And, it like, it, it could come down to score difference. That could be the difference. So, um, it was important as well for Dublin, and again, no offence to Westmead, but you know, if Dublin are to be contenders, they have to put up a, a bit of distance and keep a bit of daylight between themselves and Westmead in these matches because it could come down to a score difference. But look, credit to Westmead, they're really trying hard. Joe Fortune, in fairness, he's, he's put in, he, he has a good shape on this team, um, and they do have great individual hurlers, in fairness, in those teams that would make lots of teams across the country. We, we've referred to them in previous podcasts as well. So in fairness, look, Westmead are still looking for this this big victory in Leinster. Um, and again, it doesn't look like they're, I suppose, they're, they're going to take down one of the bigger teams today or tomorrow. But look, it's all about the steps you take towards that big day and towards eventually consistently doing it. And in fairness to Westmead, look, they're, they're, they're heading towards being really competitive. It's great to see them, I suppose, causing problems for Dublin and causing problems for Kilkenny when they're up there. Okay, they didn't cause as much problems for, for Galway in Galway. But in fairness to them, um, they, it, it, you know, they did give it a good crack against Dublin. And Dublin, again, to their credit, once it was in the jaws, they pushed away again. Um, but look, it, it's going to be interesting now for Dublin coming into the next few matches. Because again, one thing I suppose I would have been maybe critical of Dublin, let's say in the league, good win against Tipperary. And maybe the rest it under laurels a small bit, go up, play Kilkenny. And Kilkenny absolutely wiped the floor with them. So something I'd be interested with, and I do agree, James said it earlier, I think that Kenny will go to Parnell Park, and I'll say it now, I think they will go and beat them, because I think Brian again will be smarting, and it all ties in nicely together, Brian will be smarting from the weekend, and he'll be cracking the whip and training this week again, and he'll be targeting that match, because Brian won't want to be looking over his shoulder again, coming down the home straight, looking at the points, looking at score difference, he'll want to be sitting pretty up towards the top of the table, with no doubts, Dublin, great win in Wexford, but at the same time, Dublin didn't, completely close out the game against Wexford Wexford had their chances right up until the last puck of the game so for me I was kind of looking for a reaction out of Dublin here that they'd maybe kick on and put in a real 70 minute performance against Westmead and leave no doubts I still think there is a little bit of uncertainty here with the Dublin team and the one thing that I suppose Matty Kenny will be looking at is that okay good win against Wexford we only bet them by a point you know went up to Westmead left Westmead maybe in the game too long all look give credit to Westmead but maybe left it in too long now Kilkenny are coming to town and Kilkenny are hurting from uh, the way the Galway match went so look they are going well they are top of the table but like you said they have to play Galway and they have to play Kilkenny um, and play Galway and Galway it's not going to be simple I'm expecting Galway to win as well you know so as I suppose the, the layout of the matches for Dublin and in fairness to them, they've got the wins where they've needed to get the wins. But the layout maybe is putting a small bit more of a of a sheen on where they actually are in in real in reality in Leinster at the moment. Because I'm expecting Kilkenny to go up and beat them. Now it could be I could be eating humble pie here in a few weeks, but I am expecting that maybe they're not at the pace of Kilkenny and and Galway at the moment. So. Yeah, look, they're, they are at top and deservedly at top at the moment. Um, but still, there's a long way to go in this now. And, you know, as well, teams are starting to pick up a small bit of that baggage that gives them a little bit of fuel coming down the final straight as well. So, they're, they're look, they're value for money at top at the moment. But they have those big games coming. And there's still, they're still questions to be answered, I think, for this Dublin team, for us to be really sitting here going, yeah, these lads are, are really progressing on. Yeah, the other thing as well, Paul, we will be discussing injuries quite a bit because it's the nature of this round robin and how quickly the games come around. But Maddie Kenny was sent to us on the radio yesterday. The only disappointment coming out of the game for him in Mullingar was that they got Liam Rush back onto the pitch and then he pulled his hamstring. So he's probably out for the rest of the Leinster campaign. That's a bit of a killer when you have a player who's been out for a long time and in Rush's case, he would add a lot to the 15 if he comes back in. Probably hoping, give him a few minutes against Westmead, ease him back in ahead of these two games. To then lose him potentially for a few more weeks is a, a disappointment for Dublin. Yeah, it is, yeah. And especially because like Liam, Liam Rush has been moved around in the Dublin team between centre-back to full forward. They've been trying to find a place for him. Kind of an Austin Gleeson type of 
trying to move him around because he's so important to the team. You're trying to find where do we get the most out of him. And, you know, they started to put shape on the team without Liam Rush, which is sometimes a good thing to be able to do, to be able to, I suppose, take that, that star player out of it um, and let more lads maybe come to the fore and, and start leading the team and start nailing down a few positions. So for Dublin, when Liam Rush was coming back, you know, this was really, I suppose, a huge bonus for them. For Liam Rush now to be gone with a hamstring injury, you know, it's it's look, okay, they've they've been hurling away without him for the last while, but he's a great player, he's a huge player, performs really well, brings a real physical element to them as well. I mean, you could put him in full forward and he'll, you know, cause problems for Dahi Burke who'd be a very physical player or Huey Lawler or whoever. But equally you could put him down centre back and let Chris Crummy grow further up the pitch. And that's what we've also seen them do as well. Even play in midfield. He's played midfield several times for, for Dublin over the years. So he's definitely a player that you know, Matty Kenny could have done with again in these last few games. He would all very rarely has Liam Rush put in a bad performance for Dublin. So it's tough for Dublin and it's tough for Liam Rush as well. Um, you know, because he's he's in his prime at the moment, and it's tough for him now that you know is he picking up these injuries. Uh, you know, every season is important now for Liam Rush. So it is tough for him, tough for Dublin supporters and Dublin team that unfortunately they're, they're not going to have him coming down into the the really important crunch matches in Leinster. Sky, so two questions for you. First one. How aware were you that Conor Whelan was actually going to be okay for last weekend? Because we talked about this and you said, no, 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 he's two, three weeks. Not a chance he's going to be involved. <laughs> and then I see a tweet from Galway GN Friday night going, oh, look who's been named as number 26. Did, did you know last week? I, look, it was, I'm not going to lie, it was 50. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't even finish the sentence. <laughs> I tried. I tried. Oh, uh, sorry, I tried. Look, I, it was 60-40. 60 that he was back doing some, some, some high-level running, like some, some intense running. Um, but hadn't hit hundred percent just yet, so I didn't. Know, I, I hadn't confidence in that I, I was going to stand over that he was going to play on on uh, yesterday. So, um, what did they say? I, I'll I'll invoke uh, my right to not say anything at all. <laughs> so, the Fifth Amendment, please. No, the Fifth Amendment. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> the politicians. The politicians' answer would have been, "Sure, lads, we were recording that podcast on Tuesday afternoon. Sure, I wasn't going to know if he was going to be around when the team sheet was handed in to the county board on Thursday. Sure, how would I know? Um, maybe he had a remarkable couple of days in training and got cleared at some point. And that's the excuse you need to use. The second question for you, James, Connor Thompson was uh, in touch on Instagram, asked him about Westmead. Are they three, four, maybe quality players away from being competitive? I, I think they've got probably five or six really talented players who are there we've spoken about them a few times James yeah. um, kind of down the middle of their team like Tommy Doyle is as good a fullback as there is in the entire country yeah. you know, David Glennon is playing really well for them over the last couple of years uh, you've got the Doyle twins you've got Niall O'Brien I think Clark can get Nile back Bryan. to uh, oh, yeah. full form again is a fantastic hurler um, I really like Cormac Boyle I really like Joey Boyle they've got lots of good hurlers the thing is this yeah. is probably the maturity of the good players who were involved when they beat Kilkenny at under-21 level, a very good minor team a few years ago that Westmead have. I'm not sure if Westmead have those players out there to add three or four more in, but there's plenty of good players in Westmead right now. There, there is plenty, and like if you ask me, you know, are there three or four pl- players away? They are, but they're three or four top quality players away. You know, mm-hmm. It's very easy for us to say they're three or four away, but like, you're looking for them to inject a couple of guys who will be fundamental to a team, who will nearly create a further nucleus to a team. They have a couple, but then it becomes... a it becomes down to numbers. So they, they have a numerical disadvantage when they come up against the big teams because the big teams will have quality all over, whereas Westmead might have top-tier quality in half the team. You know, And that's just the, the nature of where, where they find themselves. Like, But like in fairness, they're acquitting themselves relatively well because I was going to pick up on what Paul was saying about Dublin and I, I was going to harp on about their, their lack of goals like, and to hold mm. out a clean sheet against Dublin is no mean feat. Like, yes, they conceded three against Galway and Westmead, or in, in, in Galway, you could say, but like, you look what the amount of goals that was shifted against Leash over the course of the weekend so I don't think they're doing too bad yes the score difference is poor enough let's say for both Leash and Westmead but like what do people actually expect you know what do people expect for these teams to produce against the best teams in the country so they're not going to beat them all we're asking for them is competition and for the challenge and all we're asking them is, is to maintain the challenge and to keep doing what they're, what they're doing like if they can come within five or six points maintain a challenge over the course of 50-60 minutes that's a minor victory for these teams and they have to they need minor victories and they need to, 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 to have these minor victories over the course of, you know, six months, a year and try to get a bit of traction and momentum and try to get some players in and keep the work in, in the background and, you know, out, out of the lights, as, as people would say, in clubs and etc. to try and get these players, these three or four players into the, into the mix because are they there currently? No. Can they be there in a year or two? Who knows? You were right. We, we can't comment. So 
I think the objective for West, Westmead is to maintain a challenge, maintain Division One status as best they can, and then and then see where the next where the future takes them. That's all they can ask to them. Mixed bag for Leash in that they conceded a lot. Six twenty one Wexford yeah, score. Injuries though. No. Injuries. Yeah. Like, the geez. only good news on the injuries, um, James, when it comes to this. Willie Dunphy was able to come back into the team. Wasn't expected he would be back before the break. So yeah. he's a little bit ahead of time. Ben Conroy was able to play. John Lennon came off the bench. John Lennon was brilliant when they beat Dublin as a sweeper a few years ago. I think if Cheddar Plunker can deploy him into that position, he could be very important. Because now, we said this a million times, the Westmead game is the one that matters for Leash now at the end of this. The last one in Port Leash to make sure they have whoever wins that will stay up. If they get That's those players back, Ross King one. was involved. They might have half a chance if some of these players are fit. And they've another week to rehab the injuries a little bit now with the break. Yeah. So that's obviously the good side for Leash. The bad side would be that they sunk badly, James, from the 50th minute till the 70th. So Fiacre C. Fennell was sent off in the 50th minute. It had been 110 to 7 points at half time. Wexford has started the first half reasonably well. But then after that, Rory O'Connor goes around for his goal. Mark Fanning gets to score two penalties and Dio O'Keefe scores a late goal to put even that extra bit of gloss on it for Wexford. And crucially, maybe for Wexford as well, James, they've boosted their scoring difference quite a bit with that big win. Substantially, yeah. Um, I, I would be slightly concerned for, for Leach because like, when the red card came, it's like the Red Sea parted and they opened up. Like You'd like to see them just kind of stop the rot, bring everyone back and just, you know. I know the score difference doesn't really make an awful difference to Leach because head, head-to-head matters in this, so they're probably, they are looking at the West Mead game saying that we're looking at we have it at home. It's a bit like the league situation whereby Antrim are coming to town. This is the game we have to target and, and, and let's, let's build on there. I, I wonder what kind of team they're going to put out against Galway, to be honest. Will, mm. you know, what, will they put out their strongest 15 because they're playing Galway uh, a week later? I I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Can they risk another injury? I, I, I put it there. If I was the leash management, I would be, I'd be altering my team slightly just to make sure that, that we have a full complement on the last day. I know that's probably not in the spirit of the sport. I, I get that. But at the end of the day, survival is key here. Forget about anything else. Forget about what people say in the media or in the county. Survival. So if you have to rest some of your some of your best players, look, and if they're carrying niggles and you have to rest them, so be it. You know, so be it. But, uh, like, yeah, it's a crunch game. Like, it's a crunch game. And it's, that game just kind of petered out. The Wexford game, and, you know, they got to run them and it just it lost all sense of competition, you know, so... But like like Wexford, it's it's good for them to notice that they win for the jugular, to understand that score difference is important. Like we've touched on it numerous times in the podcast, how Galway were eliminated a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks, years ago, excuse me. So if if you know if you're to graph what's going to happen in the next couple of weeks, the points are going to make a difference. The points are going to make a huge difference. So even Galway playing Leash, they're going to have to go out and as much as he hates admit it, put up a score, get a mm. score up on them, you know. And if Kilkenny get 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 on top of Dublin, yes, they'll have the head to head, put up a score on them. You know, because Dublin, Dublin aren't scoring goals, so like put up as much as you can them. To your point on that about it not being in the spirit of the game and whatever else, I mean, Cheddar Plunkett said it afterwards. All focus now has to be on Westmead. Yeah, I think Darren Gleeson and Antrim showed exactly that earlier this year. So they lost to Leash. They knew their last game against Tipperary in the regular section of One B didn't matter a yeah. jot. Made changes, conceded seven goals. People are saying, "Oh my God, look at what a scoreline Tipperary have put up on Antrim." And Antrim went back out with their strongest team a couple of weeks later and won the relegation playoff against Offaly. Which result matters? Not the one which decides what their scoring difference is going to be at the end of 1B. It's the fact they won to stay up. Similarly yeah. for Leash and Westmead, what happens for them in the penultimate fixtures and who scores what against them doesn't matter a jot now. It's all about that last game in Port Leash to decide who stays Leinster Championship for next year. So I, I think, Paul, the spirit of it doesn't really matter. No, absolutely not. And like, again, look, you just have to manage these things the best you can and I think if if you know managers were to be honest in these situations and go out and play their best team each week, we you know on the flip side we'd be turning around saying why didn't they do this you know and and critics would be turning around saying why didn't they manage it a bit better and hold back the players for the final game so you can't like I mean these these games are the biggest games um, each year deciding it's deciding a lot for for these teams so. The idea that, like, exactly like you're saying with Darren Gleeson with Antrim, you know, 100%, he had to manage it or team manage it the best way he can and have a strategy for the final game if that's what you're going to target. So it's understandable even for Cheddar Plunkett that he will view it the same way because, you know, to a certain extent, you're being bet by 15 points or being bet by 25 points, there's much of a muchness in the difference. Like, you know, you're not talking the same thing as we were bet by three and we could have won the game or whatever. Like, you know, so, and the other side of it, I'm sure there, there's players there that maybe haven't got a game and that are maybe chomping at the bit to get in and get a game. Okay, they might be involved in the game that they're going to get a bit of a beating in. Like, but 
if if the best for the team is that you target your last game because inevitably that's the one that's most important and you man and you manage it to a certain way that you hold back a few players. I mean, who could begrudge a manager doing that if if it's for the good of the team and and the county going forward? Um, I think it's very understandable, and I wouldn't really get some of the criticism around it to be honest. Mm. Well, we'll see how those games go. We mentioned Antrim, who are at this stage completely flying, uh, held on to win by a goal. Neil McManus back in the pitch, scored a goal for them at the weekend as they beat Carlo by a goal. Uh, Kerry put 30 points up on Mead to get their campaign back on track. And awfully, like Kerry, have got two wins from three so far after they beat down a nervy enough game for them in Ballycran, uh, but awfully came through, which actually sets up the Joe McDonough really interestingly now uh, going into the final couple of rounds of games because... It, uh, straight away it looks like it's a three way fight for who's going to qualify and Antrim have got a leg up on both Kerry and Offaly but Kerry and Offaly meet next in Tralee which could well decide who the second finalist is going to be and down despite the fact that they've now lost in successive weeks against Antrim and against Offaly are far from out of it because they play Meath and Carlo in their last two games so depending on what happens when the top three are playing each other in a little triangle there could potentially be a way for down back in if they win their last two games so uh, the John McDonough is going to run right down to the last round and the game to watch out for I think on Saturday week is that game in Tralee between Kerry and Offaly which will probably be a doorway to decide who's going to qualify for the final or at least it'll put a, a real complexion on the table ahead of the final round of games we move along then to Munster lads and look Claire backed it up I'll admit, before Championship got underway, Clare were fifth favourites to qualify. We all wrote down, still got the notes beside me, the three teams who were going to qualify. We were unanimous in our thoughts that it was going to be Limerick, Waterford and Cork in some order. None of us thought that Clare were going to qualify. Clare were not great in the league, played well against Limerick, but aside from that, they beat Offaly to pick up a couple of points and that was it. They got some players back who were in fairly crucial positions, like Duggan, like O'Donnell, got them all out in the field. They destructed... Tipperary last week a lot of people said Tipperary didn't hurl well but on here we said Clare hurled well and Clare hurled very well in stages against Cork at the weekend too I mean for me Paul they beat them up physically they showed their pace caused all sorts of problems for Cork during the game they went on an incredible scoring spree in the first half where they outscored Cork by 10 points to 1 after I think it was between the 10th and around the 22nd minute they were 12-3 up after 25 minutes in the game Probably should have won by more because anyone picked up the newspaper today and goes, oh, 28 points, 220. They just got out by a couple of points. I know Clare were very comfortable winners uh, throughout the game and maybe the complexion has actually changed a bit by Cork's scoring spree and the goal laid on in the game. For me, Clare, really good value to make it two wins out of two here. Oh, absolutely. And again, I, like I just I was making a few notes during the game, like the, the lead change three times in the first three minutes. So we're kind of looking at this going, God, you know, Cork got off to a good start and Clare got a few scores and we're thinking this is going to be neck and neck. And then I think it was after seven minutes, Clare had five different scores, which we were kind of going, geez, that, that's a remarkable thing. Like most teams, not that you'd be happy with five different scores over the course of a game, but it's strong. You know, it's, it's a good place. You're showing that you're popping up in scores in different places. But Clare really just kicked on then. And it was the intensity of what Clare were doing all over the pitch. I mean, you know, you think of Hayes, a cornerback, it was an exceptional game out of him, but he really created the platform. And any ball that seemed to go up into the into the Clare backs, I mean, they were just savage coming out. And the, the variety of ball they were giving into the forwards as well. And likewise, you know, they were working the ball up to a certain extent, but they were landing long balls down and they were winning the breaks. And I think they were only winning the breaks because... They were just out there fighting hard, working hard, and they just wanted it a little bit more than Cork. Um, something very disappointing with Cork was just that they were very flat. I don't know whether they didn't maybe give Clare the respect. You know, people are talking about the confidence of Cork at the moment and different things, but the bottom line, you can still go out and you can still work hard, you can still run hard, you can still put in tackles. But the variety of scores Clare were getting, the turnovers they were getting and converting that into a point straight away, you know, you think of Peter Duggan, um, you know, chasing down a goalkeeper, converting it back over into a point, then again, when maybe there was even a goal on. But you even felt, like, the atmosphere there from watching on telly, the clear supporters were just loving every second of it, particularly the first half. Just the way they went about their business was just unbelievable. And I tell you, it was really enjoyable to watch as well. Um, because so often, I suppose, we've, we've been saying that Tony Kelly has been the only man there maybe over the last few seasons. And being a one-man show but like Tony Kelly was a not say he was a bit player a part of it but he was popping up here and there but 
you know, you had lads popping up all over the pitch between Duggan, um, you know, you had Mouncey in at full forward, you had Hayes, like I said, you had Conlon. There was just players everywhere, David Fitzgerald as well. It was actually, I suppose, harder to pick out a player to play bad, really, for Clare. Um, but really, look, for me, it was just the attitude, the way they played. Um, they were full value for the win, and I, I agree with you in saying that there was a small bit of a shine put on the score at the end, that there was only two points in it at the end. For me, Clare were ten points better than Cork. Um, Cork got a bit of a purple patch and kicked it on but you, for me at the same time I don't think you ever really got the feeling even when Clare went down to 14 um, that Cork were going to Cork were going to turn them over because I think in the next 5 or 10 minutes Clare outscored Cork still 4 points to 3 I think it was so you know even at that the attitude of the Clare players that were down a man and they upped their work rate again um, to, to, to close it out so look full credit to Clare I'd hold my hands up I said I, I didn't think they were going to perform like this I thought they'd be just down at down at fifth in, in, in Munster but we're looking at him here saying these lads could very potentially be in a Munster final um, but again I still think they maybe have to kick it on a small bit more again but look it's brilliant times for the Clare supporters as well and fair play to Brian Lowen as well because again I suppose during Covid he had a bit of a rough time trying to get a good crack at it as well so now that he has a good compliment to players back he's getting results I think he, you know Great credit has to go to Brian Lowen as well for, for sticking at it and getting the most out of this Clare team. But yeah, Clare are absolutely excellent. Mm, no Munster title since 1998. Um, is there a possibility, James, that this Clare team now goes to a Munster final? Because we have to be very aware that their last two games are against Waterford and Limerick. Not to put any kind of dampener on how well they've played in their first two games. They've got two tough games to finish. Yeah, it'll, like, realistically speaking, oh God, I, I'm going to have to say that Limerick win out. Um, they, they take four from four so you probably look at the, the Waterford game and say it'll come to a head to head in that one and whoever wins that qualifies the Munster final um, they, look they've got a good start they've played but look to be honest we've we've had a we, there's a broad spectrum now we, we got an idea a broad idea of what Cork are like at the moment and you know maybe they flattered to impress us they, they deceived us a small bit let's say throughout, throughout the league and into the into the championship but they, they haven't performed well at all and a question I was going to ask you too because this is what's in my head um, not, not to you know, to go away from Clare for a moment but to ask mm. Cork are they mentally broken you know are they actually mentally broken like can you ever see this generation of players not this generation excuse me but this group of players can, can they come back from this like or do they need another injection of let's say 20s or minors to come in the next two or three years because every day we see them playing you're saying right there's going to be a big kick in them there's going to be loads of aggression there's going to be huge intent and energy and we just, it just it's not coming you know so I'm asking myself the question is that is that in the top six inches of the head and you're saying to yourself, can, are they actually capable of doing it? Like they, they moved a few people around, down to, to, down to, to full back, Joyce to centre back. You know, did they believe what they were doing? I don't know. And it's again, it's a tough question to ask. Cause I don't want to be disrespectful to the, to the group. But like, are they actually mentally broken at the moment? Can they go any further? Like, there's a real chance, a real chance to finish bottom. Go on, Paul. You can take that up. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's it's. I suppose it's something Kieran Kingston is scratching his head with at the moment again because. Like coming through the league, we're looking at them, especially after the Kilkenny match. You know how they finished out the Kilkenny match. We're going, okay, fair play to them here now. They're after showing a bit of cut and trust here now, and you know they closed out the game. And you know, it, for me, I was kind of going. There's a bit of maturity about that performance. But you know, over the weekend, um, th- there was a great opportunity here now to stay the ship and kick on again, and establish. You know, get two points on the board, and there was two points there up for grabs. And Clare seemed they wanted it, whereas Cork just didn't seem to want it at all. I think there's two things nearly at play. Is right, okay, you have the confidence as well. We've talked about it previously that Cork, well, I've said it about maybe Coleman, that he doesn't seem to know what he's doing at centre-back. But if you look at um, the, the, the Cork backs as a whole, I mean, every so often, like you look at some of the scores over the weekend, like Shane O'Donnell, a puck out came down for Ivor Quilligan, straight to Shane O'Donnell at left half forward. My and he just picked it and he turned and looked and if you look at so many of the matches that Cork play in there's players just striking chance to look at the goal and, sh- and strike it over the bar how many times in let's say in the Kilkenny Cork or the Kilkenny Galway match did that happen where a player had a ball and he was not under pressure and he was standing in a balanced position striking the ball over the bar didn't happen you know yeah. will you do it against Limerick you won't do it against will you do it against Waterford you won't so there's kind of there's an attitude thing there whether it's from the sideline that they're not coaching it that they're maybe not going hard enough in training and it, but I think a question has to be asked maybe about the culture of the team as well like not to sound like too 2022 on it by, by saying culture but like is there a fire in that team that goes regardless whether we have the personnel maybe to go toe to toe with every team that we're going to win all our positions we'll go out and we'll fight and there'll be a, a doggy dog attitude out here and we'll at least make a fair stab at it but I mean 
like it was it was a damning a damning I suppose conviction of themselves over the weekend that from minute one there was just no kicking them whatsoever and it's tough like it can be tough as a team as a player to be part of that you know no player wants to go out and perform like that and I hate to be very critical of Cork as well but at the same time you know if you want to be champions and I can guarantee you at the start of the year in the Cork camp there was lots of them lads going do you know what you know we'll use last year as motivation and we'll kick on and to where they are now it's I'd say Kieran Kingston must be just scratching his head but you know, it's a whole group. It's a group as a whole. Um, I think the management have to look at themselves as well and say, like, they're putting the team out there. Why aren't the team savage? Is it the players? Is it the management? What is it? But it's a very hard thing to put your finger on. I don't think it's any one thing at the moment. I think there's lots of things that play. Their tactical style is, it maybe some days it works. It worked against Kilkenny in the semi-final last year and got absolutely destroyed against Limerick. But there's an attitude thing. There is a big attitude thing. And I don't mean that in a negative way in that that they're, they're too big for their boots or anything. I just mean it's the fight in them. Is there a fight in them? There's a fight in Clare. Clare came out in the start of this championship fighting hard, kind of going into the unknown. And they put it up against against Tipperary. Tipperary's fancy to win. We tipped them to win. And they went out and wiped the floor of them. They went out knowing there's two points up for grabs over the weekend. And the attitude was excellent. And now they have four points. That's a great attitude. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah. And a lot of people would argue that, and argue probably correctly, that Cork, man-to-man, probably have the better hurlers. But they didn't have the better attitude. They don't have the better attitude. So you'd wonder, going back to your point of a generational thing, do they need an injection? They probably need a few of these lads coming through a bit quicker from the under-20s and so on because they have a savage underage system there. Um, the only fear is, I suppose, James, you talk about it in Galway. The underage system doesn't necessarily reflect over into your, inter- into your adult team. Mm-hmm. So just because they have it coming through doesn't mean it's going to overnight suddenly change. So it is something that, mm-hmm. you know, maybe as a culture in Cork, they have to look at it and go, we have to be, like, we're, they, they talk about the rebels and all these things. And again, I hate to be hard on them, but would would Galway go out and at least, okay, if you didn't hurl well, at least you were fighting. Would would, would Waterford do it? Would Limerick do it at the moment? They wouldn't. Um, so there is something there that they have to look at. I don't think there's any one thing with Cork at the moment that they have to rectify. There's a good few things at play. Yeah, like I hold my hands up here, lads. I had my ticket stamped for the Cork bandwagon after the comeback against Kilkenny in the semi final because I was thinking what we'd seen in the league was that they had exercised some of the ghosts about the Limerick performance in the All Ireland final by going and having a good cut at Limerick when they met in the league. I know the game descended a bit because of the two red cards, but I still thought there was a change in attitude from Cork within that game. They had played well in their other regular games in the league qualified in the top two with a game to spare, had shown a little bit about them to get past Kilkenny. You know, when the chips were down a little bit at Porky Cueve, finished the game strongly, won that semi-final. Then got to the league final, I thought they faded badly, and I thought the attitude and the lack of hustle from them at times in that final was a real concern. I know lots of people talked about, say, the way they looked leaky at the back and that, you know, Waterford were able to get in behind their full back line. But attitude-wise, that went from the forwards up. The forwards were not working hard enough that day. And Clare went out, and did something similar to what Waterford did in the league final on the same ground. So all the lessons could have been learned from just a few weeks previously. And to me, that Cork team did not work hard enough against Clare. Clare outworked them throughout the game. You look at the amount of turnovers, you look at the trouble that Cork got in yeah. on their own puck out. That, to me, James, was about Clare's application and their work rate. So you can talk about all the silky hurling, you can talk about Connellan coming out with the ball, you can talk about the way that O'Donnell was pulling the strings and all that kind of stuff along the way. But just down to basic effort and application, Clare won that battle against Cork hands down at the weekend. Absolutely, 100%. And there's an image I have in my head of Jim Ryan when he scores his point on the right. He comes, uh, he scores it, he runs back and he pushes Jim Eternity. He just pushed him like out of the way. Do you know, for, for no reason, we just come back and say a bit like a, you know, probably he was a bit hyper. But fucking, it was like an attitude, it was like a, a statement. You know, I pushed him out of the way. Seamus kept his head down and kept moving. Do you know, if that was me, I'm giving it back to him. Do you know, and... And just kind of signify that you're not going to push us around. Their attitude, like, it's not good at the moment. Like, and I, I, everyone in Clare will talk about the talk about the Tony Kelly's and Peter Duggins and Shane Donald because it's easy. It's really easy to talk about those guys because they're they've got flair. They're doing the scoring. But one guy I pick up on him, and same as last year, Rory Hayes. Like, like he is very very important to this Clare team from an attitude perspective for what he does, the job he does, and kind of the he sets the stall out like so I'm looking at him going Gee, he's, he's exemplifying exactly what I want in a player rather, whether, whether he's defensive forwards what I want in him attitude because his body language is screaming to me that he's up for anything you know what I mean 
He's up for the fight. So, like, he'll challenge every ball 50-50. He'll come out with the ball on a straight line. He's not going around anyone. He's going straight through them. And I love to see it. And, like, he's in all-star form. And the boys picked him out this Sunday game. But, like, I had picked him the week before, himself and John Connell. And they just... They're playing, like... It looks like a Brian Lohan team. Do you know? Like, I have great time for Brian Lohan because his father is a Capitagal man. So, I've followed him since I'm that, that height, you know? So... He's, it's nearly like I feel connected to him somewhat, you could say. And I just love everything he's about, you know, and the way he played full back with arms and legs coming left, right and centre and he bringing the, everything with him. And even when he's on the sideline, there's this energy about him. You know, he, it's like he's ready to throw on the red helmet and talk out himself. And I get the sense that the Clare lads have embodied that and transferred it onto the pitch. So, like Paul said, they are full value for their two victories. And then I'm, I'm really intrigued to see how they get on against the the perceived big two, if you want to call them in Munster. Um, and if they challenge Waterford heavily and cha- challenge Limerick, Jesus, who knows where they could go? Because like, what they have now at the moment is momentum. And they've got the right attitude. They've got the right players in the skill positions, if you want to call them that. They've got forwards who can score and take on. And they can mix a bit of physicality too. So, look, I, I, I don't know what clear ceiling is. I don't know what's, what's their... If you ask them, their targets in Ireland, I'm, I'm not sure where they go. Like, if they get to a Munster final, for me, that's a huge, huge success, to be honest. Um, an Ireland semi final is a huge success. So, I think it's just it's, it's a matter of see where it takes them. Mm. One ask you about the ceiling in a moment um, because again I think crucially for Clare nine different scorers in play it's not about the Tony Kelly show which it was for the last couple of years because when Tony Kelly hobbled off against Waterford that ended Clare's chances they've got more agents around who can actually do damage to teams currently and that could be crucial if at any stage Tony Kelly gets injured or there's a good man marking job and at some point or they can't get the ball to him there are other weapons which are available uh, throughout the team but Paul we talked about refereeing decisions earlier is Galvin going to the Disputes committee or to appeals first of all to try and get off that red card. Yeah, I'd say well, you might as well give it a crack anyway and see if you get him off. I I didn't think it was a red card myself to be honest. Um, you know it it, it looked like he went and like he shouldered a few lads and it looked like the the last shoulder was kind of um like the Cork player's body was between the camera and Galvin so we couldn't really see. I know some areas some some people are saying that he used the butt of the hurl. I didn't see that myself to be honest. So I think Claire will argue it. Um, because I think Paul O'Dwyer also kind of showed that a strike in motion that he maybe struck with the butt of the hurl but you know I think if you look at the camera angles that's not really present I didn't see that I, and I saw a shoulder I also probably saw a cork like maybe going down you know um, making sure that the referee saw that there was something there like you know to get him sent off and call say a spade out, a spade it, say out. well call a spade a spade <laughs> you know um, like and it's, it is something that's, that, that the lads are doing they're selling it to the referee a small yeah. bit more and it doesn't make it easier for the referee but like I think, to be honest, for me, looking at it, it wasn't even a yellow. He shouldered a few lads. The only difference was that the other lads didn't go down um, and make a hard decision for Paul Dwyer. But uh, I think if they do go to, to the appeals committee, I think if, if, if any committee looks at that, you know, you let him off because, like, I mean, we don't want to dilute it right down that players, you know, we like a little bit of a scuffle. We like lads showing passion. We like lads getting in around each other and a bit of jostling. What harm? We saw it in the Galway warm-up over the weekend that they were jostling with themselves. So why not jostle with other players? A player getting sent off for it? No, um, I don't. I don't think it should be, and I don't think he struck him with the with the hurl either. But um, so look, I think Claire do appeal it, and I, I think he gets off. But that'll be down to the committee, and I don't know what goes on behind closed doors of these committees. Mm. Well, we don't know how often we're going to apologise in this pod, but I'm going to apologise to Keown Craiga, who asked us one of our questions last week. And when I was looking down at my uh, doc where I put all the comments into them before we chat, I actually missaw the avatar and thought, ah, that looks like a Limerick uh, avatar. But no, it's not. They're actually a hurling club who are in Glasgow. And apparently on the back of us linking them with Limerick, they had players who actually dropped off the panel last week, they're claiming. They say they're the only Scottish-based team who are playing in the British Championship since 1913. So they're regular followers of the hurling pods. So uh, they definitely deserve a shout out on the back of that alone. Uh, they say that they've been fundraising over the last year or so uh, to go down and play against the English teams within the British Championship itself. So uh, they've got hurling going in Glasgow. Uh, so again, they've asked a question of us this week and wanted to point out on Instagram that they're not Limerick fans. And uh, for me to just give that clarification before asking their question. Uh, yeah. So they're saying after two wins, how far are Claire, Claire away now from the big two? So the big two being Waterford and being Limerick. We'll get James O'Connor's thought in a moment. I want to throw that to the two of you. Paul, how far away are Clare now realistically? Because we have to take their form into account. If this was power rankings, how far are they behind Clare and Limerick right now? Um, How far are they behind them? I suppose the first question you have to ask is how many lads can they bring in off the bench similarly enough to Limerick and Waterford? That's the first question you have to ask. Do they have the same firepower? No, they don't. What Clare have, I think, at the moment is definitely Clare this year can 
can go as far as an All Ireland semi final beating teams because what we've seen with Clare, we've seen them do it over over the last few years, maybe over the last you know ten years or so, where once they get the momentum up and they get their backs up, you know they have great belief in themselves and they can turn over teams and that momentum can be brilliant for a team, but it might only be brilliant for one year. That's the thing. Can they keep doing this on year on year? Um, no, I think they have to bring a few more teams through. I think I still think they're a bit of a distance away. Like I, I still don't think Clare are the team that are going to you know knock Limerick out of a championship at the moment. I don't I don't see that happening. Where I see Clare at the moment is they're after probably reconsolidating with after losing a few players over the years, but they're still relying on that core of players. And okay, they've in, they've brought in you know the likes of Hayes and these lads are really showing really well. And even Davy Fitzgerald and that has really progressed on and he's getting on the scoreboard and you're really leading lads there as well. But I just think Watford and Limerick, they're they're good. They're they're a nice bit ahead um, in terms of having more of a panel, and also just from being, I suppose, forged over the years and really having competing at high level, of competing for all Ireland's. You know, those things mentally bring on teams, and the likes of Watford, like Watford, had to go through a lot of hard days to get to where they are at the moment. Limerick, Limerick, similarly enough, Limerick are at the, obviously on the crest of a wave at the moment but you know Watford have had to compete in All-Ireland Finals and had those losses and you know mature on and they've injected players into that system so I do think there is a bit more of a road to go for Cork or for, for Clare to be up beside um, up beside Limerick and Watford and at the end of the day look not 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 to put take away from it either it's two it's two matches you know they've won two matches now at the moment let's not get carried away either it's been brilliant performance and I'm looking forward every day to Clare go out if they hurl like this it's really enjoyable to watch but I don't think we can take that after these two matches suddenly now Clare are back into the top four I don't think they are at the moment but like I said I do believe that if Clare get a bit of momentum now at the moment and they, let's say they go into an All-Ireland quarter-final and suddenly they find themselves in an All-Ireland semi-final. They're a savagely dangerous team and no team will fancy coming up against them because they're 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 fighting really hard. We see the likes of Shane O'Donnell tracking back really far. And that's hunger. That's nothing else. That's not Brian Lowe and shouting at him. That's hunger. You know, we see um, Duggan and all these lads tracking back. We see just all over the pitch. We see John Conlon fighting, going forward, winning tough ball. And that's just pure hunger. So there's no team that will come up against Clare and think, we have a good one here, or we're after getting the softer side of the draw. Every team at the moment will fear playing Clare. But I don't think, and they're, they're not at the level yet of Watford and Limerick. They have a bit more players to inject into that panel and consistently do it over a few years before they can show that, yeah, we're a team here now that has to be reckoned with for the All-Ireland. Mm. Well, don't listen to me with predictions because I'm probably bottom of the OTBAM prediction list after getting one result right uh, from the ones we did last weekend. But I think my simple answer to this would be we'll know a lot more about how close they are after the two games which they have upcoming over the next three weekends. Mm -hmm. That's not meant in a smart way, but genuinely we'll know an awful lot more when they tackle those two teams because it is going to be a step up based on what we saw from Tipperary and Cork. We'll look forward to Tipperary and Limerick in a few moments, but this is what James O'Connor had to say on Off the Ball on Sunday afternoon about that Clare performance and whether they have it in them to push Limerick later this year. There's a great energy about him now. You had Tony Kelly score and Shane O'Donnell is back, a real fan's favourite with his flamboyant, skillful style. And, you know, there's energy about Clare now. And a lot of people wouldn't have sensed that at the start of uh, the league or during the league. But Clare now look like they could be real contenders. Absolutely. I mean, I suppose, look, we, we don't arguably have the depth, um, you know, certainly that Limerick or, or, or maybe, you know, Kilkenny or or Watford have, um, you know, the panel maybe is that bit shallower. And when you're without maybe key players early on in the league, I mean, Tony Kelly obviously had ankle surgery, um, you know, wasn't available in the earlier rounds. Uh, you know, we went to Cork and, and, and took a bit of a, a, a beating down there. But, you know, I saw enough positives during the league campaign. Um, you know, we went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Limerick and Ennis, uh, could have got something out of the Wexford game. And you just felt that, look, at you know, when we have everybody back, um, and if, if Brian can get the best out of what he has, and that's what he's done since he's taken over, he's got the best out of that bunch of players, you know, we can put it up to anybody. Uh, look, at obviously, you know, with Limerick in, in, in Cusack Park in two weeks' time, um, you know, there's that border rivalry. You know, we always lift it for, lift it for Limerick. So, uh, you know, that, that's obviously a big game to look forward to. But at this point in time, you know, our scoring average is now, I think, plus 10. Um, you know, I think we've every chance that we look like we've we've, we've the groundwork done um, to secure at least that third place and maybe a place in the in the Munster final. And, and given how competitive Munster was, you know, that's 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 no mean feat for this bunch of players. Right, so that was James O'Connor uh, in conversation after the game uh, with Stephen Gleeson after Clare made it two wins from two. Uh, Thurlis now becoming their favourite venue. Maybe they'll be back there later this year again. Uh, they've boosted their chances of qualifying massively in the Munster Hurling Championship. Lads, I'm looking at the fantasy. 
And the first observation that I have when I look at the points that have been run up inside of our league is that we've got six of the top eight in the entire competition are playing in the Hurling Pod League. So some of these Sharks are obviously entering uh, quite a few leagues and doing really well. Top we of the league them. at the moment. I know we've joked about the fact that Murphy might have to go and do a day's labour for somebody. Uh, he it's might not, be it's not a joke. It's not a joke at all. <laughs> well, he, <laughs> he might be going to Herbertstown. Uh, no longer the Whipping Boys of Munster is the name of John O'Connor's team. 231 points scored during the week. Pretty decent. Overall... 786 points accumulated after three game weeks which is just nonsense i think john is top of the national rankings currently too uh, we also have got brendan noonan again i'm hearing a cork name i'm hearing o'callaghan mills is his club 769 and uh, then from drum and inch we've got shane hassett he's got 768 and just below that we got kieran kendrick CJK is his team uh, using his initials from the Moyle Rovers Club on 751 so inside our league we've got four players who are north of 750 and they're all inside the top six nationally as well that's how good they've been Dermot McGill who was top last week I think has dropped just ever so slightly down so hasn't had the best of weeks uh, scored just the 210 uh, for the Ballyfin Clubman there but <sighs> Through the signs, Dermot McGill, who was top last week, has tumbled down a little bit on 648. He's got 40 points to try and make up after the week that he's just had. And none of us think are inside the top 20. <laughs> where, where are you, Skell? Did you check? I think I'm 45th. Ooh, I think I'm around that as well. I think I was 49 when I checked within our league. But in fairness, where, to, me, in fairness to me, this is my first year doing the fantasy hurling and I didn't realise that you didn't get transfers every week. So I'm, I'm I'm not in a good position to be honest. <laughs> Half my team weren't playing this week. Well, that's it. Not not to make excuses, but like I should have what do you call it used credits to uh, transfer more players because the minute that Kyle Hayes got injured, it just messed everything up because Waterford weren't playing twice in this game week because it was a a double week for some teams, mm. and so I couldn't transfer my Waterford players out because it'd be the risk that you'd have to try and transfer the likes of Stephen Bennett back in. So I just kind of sucked it up and went, right, I'll accept that one or two of my players are only going to pick up half points for this week. The Sharks at the top all made multiple changes, and I'm sure they're going to make multiple changes again ahead of this week. Paul, where, how are you doing, or where are you? I haven't checked, but last I checked, I'm just behind the two E, so that's that's all I'm looking at. I don't think it's great now, to be honest. Um, uh, Skehill probably knows, because he likes to remind me that I'm right down the list. I'm actually not too far behind you, Will, I checked. Our scores aren't too far away. I think I'm about... 10 or 15 points behind you. So that's my target at the moment now, is to pip you. Um, I'm not targeting too much higher up the board. Skell might have this one in the bag now. That's the problem, though. And we have to listen <laughs> to him then for the rest of the while. Love. How about how about Thanks, if we sir. change the day's labour on the national leaderboard to the day's labour between the three of us? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Got this anticipation of going out to work with him and have to take it. No I way. put you picking spots <laughs> for the week. <laughs> A day's labour is what I said. <laughs> hey, at half twelve as well. Do you want some good news, Murph? Do you? Go on, give it to me. You're after beating us in the under twenty by a pint after extra time. Happy days. That is not good. One twenty eight, one twenty seven. That was on up the road, and you know it's Jesus. one of those things. A total, a total aside here, by the way. So before I went to record at you guys, um, went out for some some bank holiday breakfast with a friend of mine this morning. Ended up sitting at a table beside six Dublin fans who had booked their tickets for, well, not booked their tickets, but booked their hotel, had booked their train and everything else to come down to Offaly because they assumed that Offaly were going to beat Wexford. And they were chatting about this at the table and we got chatting to them. I was saying, look, that must be pretty annoying that you missed it. And they were saying, no, they actually relished the idea of going to provincial towns to watch games. They wanted to go and golf in Shane Lowry's home club. They mm. already had their tickets all booked for the train and for the hotel. Still came down for the weekend anyway, as opposed to going to Wexford. It's amazing what an economic boost that makes. And then at the same time, simultaneously, you got an email from Leinster Council saying that both the football semi-finals in Leinster, bear in mind, they're not on TV either. They're on in Crow Park. They're both going to be played at GA headquarters as opposed to being played in provincial towns. Like even earlier today, there was a fair few Galway supporters who were making their way in to have a bit of lunch in Tullamore before that game this afternoon. Mm -hmm. What a boost it is for towns to actually be able to Huge. play games there. To me, it yeah. seems a total waste, James, not to uh, play them, say, in Port Leash and Tullamore as opposed to a half-empty and maybe more than half-empty Crow Park. Yeah, I, like, and the reason they always give seems to be like an economic reason, but the wrong economics. I fully agree with you. If you had those Leinster games in a Port Leash, a Tullamore, you know, we're talking about Bulgaria, these places, like it, it, it brings in multiple figures uh, to a town. Like I was only talking to Aidan Hart about the Premiership and what it does for each city in each town. It's huge. Like it's worth a massive amount of money to those areas. Same with Cheltenham with the race course. Like they need this this uh, input of, of 
of money from sporting fans. Like, so I, I think there's a trick missed there, to be honest. Because, like, all right, look, to be honest, the Leinster football final and semi finals have been, you know, relatively poor contests over the last number of years. And there's, there's more pigeons in the, in the stadium than there is people in the games. Mm. Were you a bit disappointed, by the way, about the crowd that went to Salt Hill? I don't know if that was over the bank holiday weekend, but I think I saw it reported around 13,000. Now, it wasn't as low as some of the other games, like in uh, Port East, it was less than 2,000. Yeah, were you a bit disappointed with I that? Was. Like, I was like, I, I, was expecting probably around the eighteen to twenty. Um, now, Salt Hill is difficult to get to. Now, that's not a huge excuse, but it's a difficult place to get in and get out of. Like, you're you're committed to there to be there for the whole day if you're going to that game. Um, the weather didn't help too much either in the sense that it came wet, it came windy. Maybe that had something to play with it. I don't know. Like, I would have hoped to see eighty to twenty, but still, the atmosphere wasn't for wanton. The stand was full. The terrace, the far side was full. Behind both goals were scattered. You know, there was there was crowd scattering. So they gave a great lift the boys I say when, when it was needed um, and like I was surprised with actually the amount of Kenny people that travelled up because like, Kenny scored it wasn't as if there was blank applause it was, it was a good shout like so they travelled and you were hoping some more Galway people would travel um, especially for the Dublin game yeah Paul you couldn't travel because you were we run the marathon in your full army gear Course yeah, half marathon. Of course he was. Half Jesus. marathon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> half marathon there. Um, yeah, so we're running the, the, the Limerick half marathon. I actually met Paddy Marr at the starting line. He was doing the half marathon as well. Did you beat so. him? <laughs> well, no, I had all the gear on my back. So he was he sprinted off, but he passed me at one stage. And I was kind of going, geez, I'd rather nearly be wearing uh, the T-shirt and shorts now at the moment. But uh, no, no, he was well ahead of me. I think we were three hours, 20 minutes. I think we were, but they obviously had it staggered kicking off um they you know they let the different times out they don't let everyone off at once because it'd be a stampede but uh i thought we were right we'd be going i was doing the maths on it i said we'd be going off here because we're doing it for charity i'm um, seven about 20 lads from work and i said um you know but this will be about you know maybe three hours if we're starting at half 10 we'll be back at half one you know i'll quick shower get down and be able to watch the match then and sure they staggered us letting us off and a few different bits and bobs along the way it started to rain and a few different things and next thing there was a lad from Galway standing beside me Hayden Howley and he just said the Galway to Kenny match is about to throw in here now so thankfully I had the phone on me and for the last mile I was able to pull out the phone <laughs> I can't remember was it GA go or Sky go or whatever it was but uh, the, the ball was thrown in and we were coming down the home stretch seeing what the score was between Kilkenny and Galway so we were there in spirit that was the yeah, only thing a brisk only, walk I'd say was it a brisk walk exactly uh, that's it was. Did, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah but uh, look if you're to miss a match all for a good cause but um, yeah look it was a great day by all what a way to watch again well look talking about Limerick this weekend Limerick against Tipperary Limerick I'm sure will be keen now to just kind of put the foot down uh, go another step towards a Munster final with a win against Tipperary I mean, the big news coming out of it Paul Keen Lynch, he went down holding the back of his leg with a feeling it was going to be a hamstring. Limerick confirming that he's going to be out until the end of the Munster Championship. I guess, look, it's a case that they're just going to have to find solutions against Tipperary this weekend. And, you know, Tipperary have lost John McGrath with an Achilles tendon, so he's going to be out for the rest of the season. So players are kind of falling on both teams. We don't know where Kyle Hayes is at. But would the expectation be that Limerick go and make a three wins from three this weekend? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I don't think there's anything indicating... Um, anything otherwise I just think Limerick have far too much firepower at the moment um, Tipperary don't appear to be in, in a really good place do they rectify that after two weeks off I don't think they do to be honest um, uh, to be honest if, if not to be hard on them now but I think this is going to be a bit of a beating now for Tipperary um, Tip fans won't like me saying that now but look if the performance is anything like they put in against Clare and you come up and you show up with that against Limerick look I do think they'll put a bit more of a kick into them the fact that they're playing Limerick because they know it's coming but I just don't think they have the firepower at the moment to, to withhold what Limerick are going to bring. I think John Kiley will have his lads revved up as well. I mean, they're in full championship mode at the moment. Keen Lynch being out, um, as soon as he is fit again, he's back into the team. But it allows another player, Colin O'Neill or someone, to lay a claim to a jersey and potentially maybe give John Kiley, you know, a problem. If a player starts hurling really well, OK, maybe I put him in. Not to say that they outplay Keen Lynch, but certainly he gives them options as well. So... I just think Limerick have far too much there to that that Tip can deal with at the moment, um, and I don't see where it's going to come from for Tipperary to actually turn over anything. Best, I suppose, maybe Tip will be hoping for at the weekend is that it doesn't completely run away from them altogether. Um, but look, I, do, I think it's three from three from Limerick over the weekend and and carry on as you were. Yeah, James Tipperary backs against the wall. Maybe they can take inspiration from the way they hurled in the first half of the Munster final last year but a lot of the people who were evolved, involved then are not available for Tipperary this time round is there a kick in them when they so badly need it this weekend because look let, let's be honest if they lose this weekend they're out of Munster and they're out of the championship they are, I, I think they have no choice but to have a kick in them 
Um, they're, they're obviously down a very important player and John McGraw has gone for the year and like I just I struggle to see how Tipperary's forwards are going to get much change over the Limerick backs um, especially when you consider the clientele that Limerick have at hand like I, even the Tipperary forwards will have enough to contend with and stop the Limerick backs from scoring themselves um, I just it's a, we mentioned a while ago about numbers and Westmead etc with players and it's matchups here for me I just I just see Limerick have an overpowering um, sense of, of dominance in every single line of the pitch and like if you were to pick, if you were to do a combined Limerick and Tipperary team at the moment, like respectfully speaking, you probably have 12, 13 Limerick, 12 Limerick lads in it, you know, with three two, Tipperary guys. That's just the reality of it. And Go on. Who are the Tipperary players that make the 15 then? Well, I look, at, I'm, I am I love Lo McGrath. I just think he's brilliant for what he does. I love Cahill Barrett, you know, and I would have, nine times out of ten, I would have had Ronan Maher, but he just, he hasn't clicked rightly in the last couple of games, to be honest, you know. They're, they'd be my three that I'd probably bring into my head. Um, and then look, you have people argue with me who who do you replace then if you put in the, those three lads but I just think those three guys are quality and they, they, look they're going to need those guys to play famously famously this, this weekend if they're going to put up a good challenge to Limerick but I'm, I'm, I agree with Paul I think it's three from three and I, I I won't say I worry for Tip but I think it could be seven, eight, nine points of a defeat as well you know it's it's, it's going to be um like Limerick with, if they get over this game they're relatively you you say you say they could save because they have Watford on the head to head. So even if Watford win out the rest of their games, they're still going to be in the Munster final anyways. So I think they're going to go gung ho for this game and uh, roll into the following week. Yeah, scary pair with the similar team. You can hurt reasonably well against them, and they can still beat you by seven to ten points because of just the yeah. firepower that they have and the scoring they do. I'll give you the last word on it then, Murph. If you were putting a combined team together, I. I don't really like combined 15s but thanks to Skell for bringing it up uh, <laughs> any Tipperary players you'd have if you had a combined 15 between Tip and Limerick right now um, it's it's a tough one I'd probably go back and say potentially Noel McGrath like like James is saying there but Jesus other than that it's very hard but I'd, it'd be very hard with lots of teams considering that just the men that Limerick have at the moment in each position I mean they have lads on the bench that would probably make any other inter-county team no problem like you know if you look at the back line alone their full back line it's crazy what they have the selection there like like some Mike Casey started on the bench in different times and like they okay they moved out Dan Morrissey out to wing back and different things but the options they have is just is just incredible so potentially I think for me anyway at the moment even on current form like I'd agree as well with James Ronan Maher on previous form but not this year's form at the moment the only way you could look at it was potentially Noel McGrath could do something in terms of his ball winning ability and different things um, in the forward line but other than that I don't think there's any other players that man to man beat any of the Limerick lads at the moment it'd be 14 for me uh, and nothing less than that if, if you're to be anyway a bit of leeway I think it's 14 at the, at the, at the least for Limerick yeah, I think if Callanan was fit, I'd have Callanan in around the square. Maybe might free up Galan to go do something different in the full forward line. But yeah, it's an interesting debate. Leave your comments if you're watching us on YouTube and argue entirely that we're overlooking far too many of the Tipperary players that would make the Limerick team. Well, we started. Or maybe we get into one of these situations, Skell, where they're going to say, well, actually, look, the Limerick Tipperary combined 15 would be the Limerick 15 uh, that started the All Ireland final last year if they're all available. Uh, let the debate continue. So when, uh, are we, uh, when are we going to divide Limerick in half? Yeah. <laughs> Good, good, good question. I, I, there'll be a backlash about Limerick at some point. Um, everyone enjoyed the story in 2018, and even when they were winning, I didn't. <laughs> well, you didn't, obviously, but neutrals, <laughs> neutrals enjoyed it a little bit. And then you know they were beaten in 2019, and Tip and Kilkenny went back for a traditional final, and they won a couple during COVID. So no one was really getting annoyed about their success just yet. Yeah, I tell you, if this team runs off three or four in a row, and it starts getting into potentially becoming the first hurling team to do five. I guarantee at that point you're going to hear people saying, ah, oh, it's JP's money and you know, mm. Limerick are too strong and you wait for it. These, these arguments will happen. Yeah, on another podcast now, we'll have to, we'll, we'll have to ask Murph, like, uh, do, do a Kilkenny of the, the, uh, the dominant era and the Limerick of today. Do a combined 15 there. Who, who well, make, who? I think they did it there about a week ago and Taggy yeah. had half forwards on half forwards, which the boys ripped into oh, me about. <laughs> he'd, Eddie, he'd Eddie Brennan, Mark and Hegarty at one point, I think. <laughs> And then swapped yeah, I think he mixed his Morrissey's up then as well. His Dan Morrissey, Morrissey and Sam Morrissey. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. You'd have to take it up with Taggy now, to be honest. Have a look back. Go to YouTube. Have a look at Taggy <laughs> on OTBAM. I think it was last Tuesday morning. It kind of descended into that conversation after what Tommy had said the week before about the teams going up against each other. And then the first thing Tommy was quick to point out when he was on a couple of days later was uh, Taggy's obviously trying to throw John Kiley off the centre. He's putting Eddie <laughs> Rennan to follow Hegarty around. But um, a good debate. Maybe it's one we can have next week. We'll update our power rankings next week as well because we haven't done that in a few weeks. I think we'll know the lie of the land when this uh, game between Limerick and Tipperary finishes at around four o'clock this coming Sunday as well. Lads, thanks a million. Sound, lads. 
Thanks and we'll be back Paul. next Monday for the podcast, 7pm, wherever you pick up your podcast. And on Tuesday evening, we'll be streaming on YouTube as well.